this uh, event. Uh, next to me, I hope you can uh, hope you can see her <laughs> <laughs> on the screen <laughs> is uh, Tanya Teria, who uh, is one of the co-editors of uh, Translate 12. The other co-editor, Violeta Polanski, is in Edmonton, and maybe she's joining us by Zoom. I I don't know. Uh, in any case, I wish to extend thanks to both of them, Tanya and Violeta, for the for the help they provided uh, with Translate 12, because it's uh, uh, it, it's quite a bit of work. <laughs> I don't want to go into many details on that, but um, uh, there's a there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, and uh, I'll introduce uh, right away Bill Bunn, if you wanna join us on zoom as well oh like right in yeah okay. right, right right in there right in okay okay so bill uh, bill will be uh joining joining us later and uh, reading i translated a couple of essays from uh, bill Bunn to uh in, into uh translate 12 so that's the reason bill is here so welcome to both I start <laughs> Uh, I, uh, I actually didn't prepare anything, uh, anything written, so I'm just going to uh, add lib uh, on, on Translate. Uh, as uh, the title says, it's Translate 12, so this is the 12th edition of this uh, wonderful initiative that was started, uh, I believe, in 1992 by uh, Susan Uroyu from Calgary, well-known translator and uh, interpreter who won the prize, uh, the general awards, Gen governor general's award for, um, for translation. Uh, I believe it was in uh, 2015. So Susan Uriu has been very um, solid base and um, help and activist for translation in uh, in Calgary for many, many years. So thanks to her, thanks to her Translate One was born. Uh, she did the first two volumes and then this was passed on to Nézida Loyer, another translator who did two, another two volumes, then to Maureen Ransom, who did another two volumes. <laughs> um, I'm gonna forget somebody, uh, you carry Meldrum, uh, did one, and uh, Translate 12 for me is the third. I've, uh, I've done uh, volume 10, volume 11, and uh, volume 12. And I will gladly pass this on to Tanya and <laughs> Violeta and uh, stay in the background to, uh, to help with uh, volume 13. The idea with uh, Translate 12, Translate was that the a new edition would come every two years. And that was basically uh, the way it went until, uh, well, 2019, where, uh, you know, we know what happened. So, so Translate 12 was delay delayed uh, two years, basically. And uh, I took the first opportunity I could see, okay, uh, seems to be, things seem to be letting up. So I'm, let's go for it so that we can, move on and get into volume 13 and keep uh, keep the ball rolling. So that's the idea. Um, I've uh, personally, I've contributed to Translate since volume three. And I like to say that I specialize, specialize in, uh, in Alberta authors um, for a number of reasons. Uh, they are easy to get to. <laughs> uh, they are easy to meet unless they are, they've passed. Uh, it's easy to get their authorization for reprint. And I also like to think that um, you know they need more exposure, and um, so there's some some advantages to me, and I hope advantages to them as well in being um, uh, showcased in, uh, in various editions of Translate. 
So I started, I'll go back a little bit if you don't mind, and this, this is part of letting people know about uh, Alberta authors, some you may know, some you may not. I started in volume three with Marianne Middledean, uh, who wrote a wonderful book, Parachutes, a uh, wonderful novel uh, that takes place in uh, the jungle, in the Amazon jungle, and it involves weird things being done to natives, including medical experiments and uh, uh, tropical disease and pandemic and uh, Whoa, okay, that uh, rings a bell. So parachutes, uh, Marian Medellin, and then I went, uh, it was Richard Harrison, I've translated Richard Harrison a few times, some of his hockey poems, and then his uh, September 11, uh, 2001, just hard hitting poem. Uh, Thomas Wharton, I also translated a little bit, and it so happens that uh, Ice Fields is just here. <laughs> Um, uh, who else did I work with? Uh, Sid Marty, that was a big name. Um, Jerry Ald from uh, from Canmore. Bill Bunn, today. Um, and uh, John White, uh, Banff poet, uh, who passed away in the 90s, um, I believe. And I think that brings, uh, yeah, I think that brings it to, uh, to summarizes basically my contribution to, uh, to translate. Uh, Tanya Teria is uh, first her first contribution. Mm -hmm. uh, a number of, a number of authors and writers. So I'm going to uh, read them all. In um, do the translator first, and then the. Uh, um, and then the author, so Marta Concari, an Edmonton translator, who translated uh, into Italian Grace Parota King, who is an Edmonton lawyer, and a short piece about mentoring um, the role of women in, in Italian traditional society, a great little text about mentoring. Mariam Le Gobeau-Regard, who translated a couple of poems by uh, British writer Rachel Boast. Uh, Jean-Marcel Morla uh, from Montreal, uh, Lynn uh, translated Lynn Kutsu Kake, uh, who has you know a Japanese name but writes in English and that was translated into French. Diana Manol um, lives in Toronto and she, she's a poet herself from Romania and writes in Romanian but also translates English into Romanian and she translated a couple of um, Romanian uh, poets, Nora Yuga and uh, Claudio Comartin. Maureen Ranson, Calgary uh, translator, who works on a regular basis with Sylvie Massicotte. Sylvie Massicotte, a Quebec writer, writes in French, and Maureen translates into English. Uh, Eva Lavergne uh, translated Marilyn Dumont. Marilyn Dumont is uh, native Métis of uh, Gabrielle Dumont uh, lineage. So Saskatchewan Métis based. Uh, so there's some native uh, uh, poetry there, a number of uh, number of poems by, um, really good poems by Marilyn Dumont, greatly translated by Eva Laverne. And then uh, Christelle Morelli and Susan Orlew, I already mentioned Susan, uh, translated Jean C. Oui, who is, uh, Quebec uh, native um, poet, writer, and so he translated him into English. Tania Terrien uh, translated from Danish into English. Uh, a couple of authors, uh, Sosha Flory Raymond and Birgitta Trankert. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Tania will probably read a little bit of Danish as well. <laughs> So. You don't think so, maybe just the English. Eh? <laughs> uh, Violeta Polensky uh, translated uh, an amazing text, uh, something I found I find just great, uh, from a, a, a Polish writer, Marius Sicisiel. And Polish is not as good as it should be. Uh, it's a journal of uh, 
of a woman sitting at her window and taking notes. Dozens and dozens and dozens of booklets of everything that happens in front of her window. The number of people who walk by and so on and so forth. Um, hundreds. There's, a, there's actually a couple of pictures and uh, pictures of all these booklets that she wrote over uh, a, period of, a period of time. Uh, Li Ying, Amelia Hu, is in Vancouver, and she translated into English uh, Ling Ling Li, uh, a Chinese writer who is uh, who is wheel wheelchair bound in in China, and uh, was thrilled to receive a book from the translate, it made it, made it all the way to, uh, to China, amazingly, uh, as well as um, into, you know, into Poland and Romania and, uh, and uh, even in other countries. Uh, Jamie Poudrier is in Edmonton and uh, he translated Margarito Cuellar, um, Mexico, I believe. Rachel Martinez uh, translated Geyser da Costa, uh, who wrote, um, 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 ah, should have reviewed all of this before. Uh, Tatiana Samsonova uh, translated a couple of Russian authors into English, Sergei Alkutov and Lia Lubimorskaya. Laurie Saint Martin, uh, quite a famous um, translator and author herself, teaching at uh, UCAM. Uh, translated from Spanish, Gustavo Nielsen, and then finally, Gilles Mosler translated Bill Bunn. Uh, so the idea is to do a little bit of uh, a little bit of reading of some texts. Uh, unfortunately, since Tanya doesn't want to read <laughs> any Danish, uh, it will just be French and English. Actually, the role of translate is that the original text or the translation have has to be in one of the two official languages of Canada. So there's a little bit of a, everything for everybody. If you are somewhat bilingual, then you can access all of these texts, whether they were actually written in French or in English for starters, you can read the translations of Polish and Chinese and um, Romanian and Russian and so on and so on. Um, so I, I think I'm going to pass it on to uh, Tanya. Oh, you want me to oh yeah, I'll, I'll go last <laughs> with, with you and we'll see, okay. we'll see how late we can keep you entertained. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, as we say, uh, do you want, Tanya, do you want to read a little bit of those two what are they? Short stories, uh, essays. Uh, how, they're, they're, how would you describe I'll, them? I'll leave a book back, unfortunately. Yes. <laughs> um, I've heard some people call them poems, but I think they're more yeah. like short stories, uh, and they're quite short. Um, so I'll just do one after the other, <clears throat> and I won't read them in Danish um, because it's been a long time since I've been in Denmark, and my pronunciation slipped quite a bit. Uh, and I would, if anyone knows anything about Danish, you know that pronunciation is everything. So <laughs> I'll start with the first one. Olives uh, by Socia Flory Raymond. We are the sort of family who rises to clear the table the moment the last of us finishes eating. The children clear the dishes, the adults load the dishwasher. When the children get older, they too load the dishwasher. When the children get even older, they too wash the big pots and pans. And when the children are grown children, they tell the smaller children that they also need to help clear the table. They ask if they think the table will clear itself. It all goes round like this in a circuit, ending with us shouting at Uba, our grandmother, to sit down, especially now with the walker. This way she can sit at the empty dinner table and munch on olives, working one after another in her cheeks spitting the pits out onto a yellow napkin. And then the second one, City with a Lid by Brigida Tvankia. 
I'm sitting on blue linoleum amidst kids playing with Lego, Ninja Go, and plastic food, plastic cheese, plastic croissant, plastic pizza. Out of my mouth come words that don't fit together. The kids seem to think it's okay. Their language isn't fit either. I have some toys in my hand. I'm part of a bit of one game and then part of a bit of another. The kids climb over my legs, under my arms. They lean up against my back and hang from my shoulders. I take their faces home. I take their eyes and the small almond-shaped eyelids with me. I take the rounding on a wide beak-like nasal ridge with me. I take stuffed cheeks, small square milk teeth, and the voice behind home with me. I've packed a backpack and a string bag. I walk to the main train station when I'm off. I wait up in the arrivals hall, only walking down to the platform minutes before the train departs. When I get off the train, it has gotten dark. I walk from the second to the first platform under the viaduct. There stands my father, waving from in front of the little yellow station house. The way he waves, I will write a book about him one day. He recognized my back and my gait from the other side of the tracks, he says, and hugs me. We get in the warm car. I don't know why, but I ask if he will go out and look for me if one day I'm missing. He will. He drives away from the station and out onto the black country road. I tell him that I was alone in the daycare with 13 children today. I ask how he and mom managed with three small children back then. It was no problem. Each day was an eternity, he answers. My father speaks slowly. There's a meticulousness about him that begins in his speech. The problem was the loneliness after you had grown, he continues. I tell him it's lonely to become an adult, that I would like him close by, even though he no longer has to take care of me. Same here, he says. My eye catches the stars as I walk out into the yard. My father has hung a map of the darkest places in Denmark up on the kitchen cupboard. One of them is here. I stand with my bags in my hands and gaze up at the sky. I come from a city with a lid, he says, meaning Copenhagen. My mother sits in the kitchen reading. We can see her from outside in the dark. My father takes the bags out of my hands and carries them in through the utility room. I follow him in. He takes his boots off and shows me his new wool socks. They remind him of flowers in Iceland, even though he's never been to Iceland. My father's food tastes of my childhood. I mostly remember my mother making food when we had guests. Now she's making food for me because I'm a kind of guest in her house, and then again not. She's made steamed fish and kale salad. She's sliced beets and apples into fine squares, laid serviettes on plates. She loves to toss statements around. She pinches her eyes together and says things like, marriage is prostitution with consent. I say she's always so dramatic. My father says the meal tastes wonderful. If it were up to my mother, all the windows in the house would be open year round. If it were up to my father, their dirty clothes would be hung outside on a line and it rained. As a rule, they think each other's ideas are bad. They disagree about most things. They agree that they love each other, that there is a God, and that they can go to yoga together Tuesday evenings. And then there's literature. Through it, they breathe. I ask if they have read Pia Busk. They shake their heads, and I tell them about the book Karina and I, about chestnut trees in bloom, about Cairo, about Ovid, and prostitution. They both look at me interested, and I think about how each thing I know is a thing they have taught me. That's it. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. Uh, can, can you tell us a little bit about those pieces? Uh, you have some connection with the writers, I think. So um, do you have a bit of background on, uh, on these to share, to share with us? I, I don't really. So uh, I, I got the call for submissions. And uh, I had been watching this anthology for many, many years and have been too afraid to actually submit anything. 
Uh, but the day the call for submissions came in, I happened to be reading a Danish literary journal and there was this very tiny one paragraph piece in it. And I thought, well, I could probably do that. So I did that and then I thought, well, it's pretty small. Maybe I should find another one. And I, same journal, I found another one, which was a page and a half. And I thought, well, okay, maybe I could do that too. <laughs> so I did that one and I just wrote them and they were, they're really young, um, new writers, newly out of school. Um, and they're super excited to be translated into English. Uh, and, but that's actually all I know. I know they're writing a book together, which I think will be a great compliment to this experience. Their, their voices seem to weave together really nicely. That's all I can say about this question. I wish I had more. All right, well. Thank, um, th thank you, Tanya. Yes. I'll, uh, I'll I'll borrow your yeah. uh, your book again to uh, to do the introduction about uh, about Bill, and we'll, uh, I'll do and then I will read a little bit of French to change or a change up. Um, Bill will then read a little bit of English. Uh, since I translated two of his texts, we'll uh, we'll read a little bit of each in French and a little bit of each in English and we'll uh, we'll let the we'll let them hanging um, you want to know the end you just have to buy the book <laughs> um, so let's see little bun Some people, some authors like like to talk about themselves and uh, all the books they have written and all the stuff they have done. Um, Bill is not one of these. <laughs> I, had, I had to push him and prod him and push him and email him uh, because uh, the little blurb he provided was three line blurb. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> you've done more, much more stuff. So this is what he finally uh, provided. Bill bunn has been teaching English at Mount Royal University in Calgary since 1996. His main teaching areas include composition, visual rhetoric, environmental humanities, and instructional design. Uh, if you have questions about that, you, you can ask what environmental humanities and instructional design is all about. Uh, he's a young adult novelist. It's young adult and then novelist. <laughs> uh, he has three young adult novels. <laughs> Dog Boy, written in 2012, Kill Shot in 2015, Out on the Drink, 2017, Out on the Drink, that doesn't seem like a young adult novel, but I don't know. <laughs> and one adult novel, a Ghost in Theory, published in 2021, and I believe Shelf Life Books has copies of at least that, that one, yeah. Uh, his children's book, uh, Moon Canoe, was released in 2003 and translated into French as Canoe Lune, not by me, uh, in uh, and published by Le Canotier Editions in 2005. His uh, published, published essays uh, from the Globe and Mail uh, were collected in uh, Hymns of Home in uh, 2013. And that's the two pieces I, I chose are from that, uh, from that wonderful collection. There's uh, how many? 29, 30? 29. 29 uh, essays that were originally published in the Globe and Mail between uh, 2009 and 2020, somewhere like that. Something like that. Something like that, right? Uh, and uh, a, you know, a great idea to, to publish them in as a, as a volume. I really, uh, I really enjoyed this. Uh, so, well, um, I'll read a little bit of the first one I translated. If you understand French, 
great. Uh, if you don't, then you'll find out what it's about when Bill reads his side of the story. Uh, okay, I'll let you know right away. It's, it's a Christmas day. Toute la lumière sur le rire du Père Noël. Les gens disent souvent qu'il y a plus de bonheur à donner qu'à recevoir. J'étais très jeune la première fois où j'ai entendu cette phrase et je me souviens avoir pensé qui est assez stupide pour croire une chose pareille. Ainsi, j'ai longtemps cru que l'unique objectif de ceux qui disaient ça était d'obtenir le plus grand nombre possible de cadeaux. Maintenant que je suis père de famille, je me rends compte que cette phrase n'est pas une simple maxime, mais qu'elle reflète une sagesse profonde. En effet, des membres de ma famille m'ont aidé à plusieurs reprises à comprendre toute l'étendue de cette vérité. Je sais que mes proches ont tous de bonnes intentions, qu'ils nous aiment et nous soutiennent. Pourtant, les cadeaux qu'ils font à mes enfants illustrent un esprit tout ça tout bonnement diabolique et quelque peu incompréhensible. Par exemple, il y a trois ans pour Noël, une de mes tantes avait acheté à notre plus jeune fils une boîte de 10 000 petites languettes adhésives et je le revois un paquet d'au moins 150 à la main, occupé à parcourir toute la maison en cherchant des endroits intéressants où les coller. Trois ans plus tard, j'en retrouve encore régulièrement ici et là, comme ce fut le cas aujourd'hui, sous une de mes chaussettes. Ces languettes adhésives furent la première salve des surprenantes offensives de générosité de mes proches. Pour cette même fête de Noël, une grand-mère avait offert aux enfants une petite guitare électrique en plastique qui produisait trois solos de hard rock. La clé de ce cadeau empoisonné était le réglage du volume sonore, un bouton placé sous les fausses cordes de l'instrument. Au plus bas niveau, les sons émanant de cette guitare n'étaient pas désagréables et ils pouvaient bercer nos illusions parentales que nos enfants s'en contenteraient. S'emparant de l'instrument, notre fils appuya sur une touche déclenchant un solo de guitare, puis il commença à manipuler le bouton du volume. Une fois celui-ci tourné au maximum, il le laissa dans cette position, satisfait d'avoir identifié le fonctionnement du monstre en plastique et confirmé que ses hurlements stridents ne pouvaient être poussés plus haut. Deuxième attaque frontale reçue en pleine face. Après ce Noël fatidique, les attaques continuèrent au rythme des anniversaires. Un oncle nous asséna un coup dévastateur il y a deux ans. En effet, il demanda aux enfants s'ils voulaient une batterie. Un ensemble de percussions au grand complet, dont quelqu'un cherchait à se débarrasser, et ce, gratuitement. Comment une telle idée peut-elle traverser le cerveau d'un adulte qui possède toutes ses facultés mentales Et ensuite, proposer ça à des enfants Comment ces derniers auraient-ils pu dire non à une pareille nouvelle J'espérais en vain que prévaudrait une douce appréciation musicale. Mais il est bien connu que la psyché infantile ne tolère aucune délicatesse par rapport à une batterie. Tambours et cymbales sont faits pour être frappés, battus avec le bois des baguettes et avec toute l'énergie, toute la fougue dont les enfants sont capables. Pour l'anniversaire de nos filles jumelles, nous avons reçu un autre boulet de canon, de la colle pailletée. Une fille a reçu 40 tubes multicolores, l'autre 14 grandes bouteilles. Que peut-on faire avec autant de colle Eh bien, coller des choses, par dit. Du papier, évidemment, pour commencer, ensuite, quand on n'a plus de papier ce qui arrive assez rapidement puisqu'on n'a pas besoin d'une grande quantité pour recoller une feuille. Donc, quand on n'a plus de papier, eh bien, on passe à d'autres choses, à des supports plus intéressants. Les cheveux, les habits, les meubles, les autres enfants. L'année dernière, le Père Noël a débarqué avec l'arme de destruction ultime. En un seul mot, peinture. So, Bill, do you want to uh, tell us what this is all about? 
Well, I guess I could. Actually, it's it's nicely themed tonight, you know. But yeah, but like we were, kids were a big yeah. part of what you read. Um, okay. Yeah, keep keep going, keep going, keep going. Well, yes, I I would say um, um, my essay writing began because I just love the psychedelic nature of kids. They're out of their minds, and they don't see the world in a very um, uh, organized way yet. And so I found it refreshing, uh, annoying as well, and a lot of work. But that's where these came from. Um, this one is all about um, the real reason Santa Claus laughs is what I called it. And it's about receiving gifts because my sister used to give us gifts that were, it just caused so many troubles in the house. And I resented her for it. And uh, so that's what this is about. I didn't really resent her. Well, no, I, maybe I did. I don't know. The real reason Santa Claus laughs. The wisdom goes this way. It is more blessed to give than to receive. I remember hearing that one as a young child, wondering who would fall for that line. I always felt those who clung to that advice were hoping for lots of really large gifts from everyone else. As a parent, I now know that this is not advice, but a profound truth. My relatives have taught me this lesson most pointedly and repeatedly. All of them have had a most pleasant demeanor, very supporting and caring, and they know how to laugh. Yet their gifts, the gifts they buy for my children reveal genial di diabolism that few understand. Three Christmases ago, an aunt bought our young son 10,000 sticky notes. I remember him strolling around the house with 150 of his collection in his hand, looking for places, interesting places to stick them. And now, three years after the gift hit, I often discover after a stroll through the house, as I did today, that one of uh, that I have one stuck to my sock. The sticky notes were the, only the first in a in a were only the first fist in a bamboozling wave of offensives. The same Christmas, Grandma purchased our kids a little plastic guitar that did three hard rock guitar solos. The real barb of the gift was the volume knob, a lump of twiddly plastic just below the fake strings. Guitar played, the, played well at, at a whisper volume, encouraging parents to believe that the child might play with it quietly. The child playing with the toy would push one of the buttons and get a guitar solo going and then fiddle with the knob. Once the child did the discover that the volume was full, he or she was content and left it there. The volume control served only to help the child confirm that, in fact, the screaming plastic was up as loud as it could go. That was the second row of knuckles finishing a right-left combination. The attacks continued on, regularly, on regular holiday intervals ever since that fateful Christmas three years ago. Our family suffered a crippling volley two years ago. Someone asked our kids if they wanted a free full drum kit that someone happened to be giving away. What adult with a clear head would do such a thing? And what child with a clear mind would say no to drums? I wished vainly that a quiet musical sentiment would prevail. However, any childish sen sensibility cannot tolerate the quiet playing of drums. Drums are to be beaten sense senseless with a blizzarding wooden bravado. At the twins' birthday last year, another relative socked us with another, her gift, glitter glue. One of our daughters received 40 multicolored multi tubes of glue. The other received 14 large bottles of the stuff. What do you do with liters of glue? You glue things. Paper to begin with. And then when you run out of paper, which is easily done when you think of how much glue is needed to coat an entire sheet of paper, you move on to other things hair, clothes, furniture, children. Last Christmas brought the last boat to the beachhead, paint. I'm supposed to stop there and say, you should buy the book if you <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Why, why, why don't you stay? Uh, okay. It goes for um, for the for the next reading. Um, yeah, this uh, hymns of homeless is just full of little nuggets, little gems like like this. Uh, one I particularly liked, uh, and uh, the, the the first one, the uh, the real son, the real reason Santa Claus loves. Um, I actually translated and uh, read on uh, French CBC uh, for uh, Christmas about five, six years ago. Uh, they were very happy to have a, a Christmas scene, um, you know, text to, to read. Um, but the, the reason I came to, to Calgary from France is, uh, as I like to say, because the mountains couldn't be moved to Winnipeg. Uh, so I came to Calgary for the mountains and I stayed here because of that. So I have a particular interest in mountains. That's why I ended up translating uh, Sid Marty and Jerry Lord and uh, Graham Paul that I forgot earlier on, as well as uh, John White, uh, Banff, Banff uh, famed poet. And so when I uh, when I happened to, um, I also translated one that didn't get published in uh, translate uh, from Ben Gad, uh, author of the, the famous handbook of the Canadian Rockies, the Bible of the, of the Rockies. Um, and I also read that on the French CBC, the, the Christmas prior. And that's how I landed on Hymns of Home. I went to a reading by Bill at uh, Mount Royal University and talked to him about, you know, our Christmas, uh, this is what I've done. And, and Bill mentioned, oh, there's a couple of Christmas stories in there you may be interested in. So that's how I, <laughs> that's how I found that. And I was also very happy to find a, a mountain text that is absolutely magical. And in the same, in the same vein, but less destructive, uh, <laughs> but, same original kid thought that asking questions that you wonder what, where the heck is that coming from? So I don't know if I, I think I will read uh, enough to give you a bit of an idea of this. Les montagnes, les baleines et la lune du mois de juin. Nous sommes debout devant une montagne. Les enfants la regardent, émerveillés. Cette rencontre leur tire babillage et exclamation. Leur réaction s'intale sur la paroi comme autant de touches de peinture. Nous devrions venir plus souvent à la montagne. Moi, celle-là, je l'ai vue des dizaines de fois. Je sais ce que sont les montagnes. Je sais même comment elles se sont formées. Je ne lève pas la tête. Je n'ai plus besoin de le faire. « Regarde ça, papa !» s'exclame une de mes filles. Pour lui faire plaisir, je lève les yeux tout en sachant ce que je vais voir. Je suis au pied d'une montagne. « Qui a construit ça ?» demande mon petit garçon. Il cherche une explication à cette masse gigantesque qui se trouve devant lui. Je dis que personne n'a construit ça, que c'est une montagne. Cette réponse banale déclenche une deuxième interrogation. C'est quoi une montagne D'après mon dictionnaire, une montagne est une, je cite, « élévation naturelle du sol caractérisée par une forte dénivellation entre les sommets et le fond des vallées. » Je hoche la tête. Cette phrase est claire, elle est raisonnée, elle définit bien son objet. Quelques mots dans une publication officielle et le tour est joué. Pas besoin de répéter la question. Toutefois, debout face à cette paroi, je me rends compte que cette définition ne convient pas vraiment. Je tente d'en trouver une meilleure, mais les mots s'embrouillent dans ma tête avant que je puisse la formuler. Je regarde de nouveau la montagne. Elle me domine désormais. Notre raison peut en déduire, réduire la taille assez facilement, mais l'émerveillement la transforme en un, en un objet beaucoup trop grand pour notre pensée. Cette taille gigantesque, comment la représenter 
je me console en disant que la raison corrompt facilement son objet. Un de ses défauts est d'être bien trop rapidement satisfaite. Car pour qu'elle arrive à saisir cette énorme masse rocheuse, il faut que nos sens aient d'abord été émoussés. C'est à ce prix que notre raison nous fait croire qu'une simple définition, une brève ligne de texte, puisse arriver à capturer, puisse arriver à capturer la réalité de la montagne. Piètre tentative qui s'apparente à vouloir recouvrir les murs d'une grange rouge avec un seul litre de peinture verte. Marché de dupe, la montagne accouche d'une souris. Mon fils écoute poliment mon explication, mais me pose la même question cinq minutes plus tard. Il la répète parce qu'il attendait que ma réponse soit proportionnelle à son interrogation. Il pensait obtenir une réponse de la taille d'une montagne. Pris au dépourvu, je ne peux que réitérer mes paroles comme si elles pouvaient satisfaire la curiosité de mon fils. Il y a pourtant un danger évident à cela. Mon insistance risquerait de le convaincre que mes explications sont les seules possibles. Elle pourrait finir par imposer un silence définitif à sa curiosité. Si c'était le cas, j'aurais réussi à étouffer mon enthousiasme avec le masque hypocrite d'un politicien véreux. So that's why we agree to start. Did I go too far? No, maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. Mes enfants sont beaucoup plus raisonnables que moi. Une de mes filles arrive avec une sucette géante. « Regarde ce que je suis venu d'acheter », annonce-t-elle fièrement à son frère. Je la reprends gentiment. « Regarde ce que je viens d'acheter. »« Mais papa, c'est bien ce que je suis venu te dire », réplique-t-elle. Et c'est elle qui a raison. D'un point de vue grammatical, elle applique les règles du langage de manière trop systématique plus systématiquement que moi. Mon rôle de père serait alors de court-circuiter sa logique en la confrontant aux nombreuses bizarreries de notre langue. Exception que moi, étrangement, j'ai appris à accepter comme raisonnable. En fait, les questions de mes enfants m'aident à déterminer toute l'étendue de mon ignorance. Vers la fin du mois de juin, ma fille mère regarde la ligne d'horizon accouchée d'une lune jaune-orange. C'est quoi la Lune Je suis tenté de lui dire que c'est le satellite naturel de notre planète. Elle en fait l'orbite une fois par mois et qu'illuminée par le Soleil, elle reflète une partie de sa lueur sur la Terre. Ma fille prendrait un moment pour mettre ma réponse en rapport avec le spectacle naturel avec le spectacle auquel elle est en train d'assister, puis me dévisagerait comme si je venais de lui raconter une blague qu'elle n'a pas comprise. Je choisis, donc, je choisis donc de ne rien dire, de laisser devant nos yeux la lune monter dans le ciel. C'est vrai, mes enfants sont plus raisonnables que moi. Prenons par exemple cette question d'Élise, la sœur jumelle de May. Pourquoi les planètes ne sont pas des nés Des nés. Je lui ai demandé de la répéter plusieurs fois jusqu'à ce que je comprenne toute l'envergure de son interrogation. Bien évidemment, je n'ai pu apporter aucune récompense appropriée. Pourquoi les planètes ne sont pas des nés Pourquoi les chevaux ne sont pas aussi petits que les chiens et les chiens gros comme les baleines, pourquoi les oiseaux ne volent pas dans l'eau Pourquoi les poissons Pourquoi les oiseaux ne volent pas dans l'eau et les poissons ne nagent pas dans l'air Pourquoi <rire> Ok, il a décidé de commencer. It sounds fantastic when you translate. Yeah, I gotta say, it's not, it's not, it sounds better than it actually is. Nah, it sounds better in English. Um, we, 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 were, we were talking with Tanya a few minutes ago. Um, one never likes one's own writing. It's true. It's like listening to your voice on a recorder. And one, one, never, one never likes one's own translation. Mm -hmm. 
Is that right? Whoa. Difficult. Okay. Okay, I've got this. Okay. This is one of my favorites. Uh, kind of captured the heart of um, parenting and, and, and the delights of parenting and such. I call it of mountains, moons, whales, and June. I'm standing with my children who are staring at a mountain rising before our feet. The children babble and shriek when, as they meet the mountain. Their responses slop on the mountain like paint. We don't get up to the mountains as often as we should. I've seen the mountain many, many times before. I know what mountains are. I even know how they got here. I don't even look up. I don't need to anymore. Look at that one, Dad. One daughter says to me, I look for her sake, knowing what I'll see. I'm standing at the foot of a mountain. Who built that, says my young son. He's hunting for a thought big enough to fit what he sees. And I tell him it wasn't built by any person. It's a mountain. My poor answer leads to his next question. What's a mountain? My dictionary calls a mountain a large, abrupt, natural elevation of the ground. I, found my, I find myself nodding as I read it. It makes sense. It is reasonable. One sentence in an official publication and the question is put to bed. It need not be asked again. But as I stand at the foot of the mountain, I realize that this answer is not adequate. I start a few sentences, but the words quit before they're out. I look at the mountain again. It looms now. Wonder makes the mountain too big for thought. Reason shrinks it enough to fit easily. How big is this mountain supposed to be? I console myself. Reason is a popular corruption. One of its larger flaws is, is that it's far too easily satisfied. Reason only works if the senses have been numbed enough to the presence of this ponderous mound of rock that, that a definition, a tiny one-liner, could possibly cover this thing. It's an attempt to paint a red barn with a green paint, uh, with a pint of green paint. It's a trade, the mountain for a molehill. Mole my son listens to my definition of a mountain politely, but then five minutes later, he asks the same question. He repeats his question because he assumed I could answer in proportion and kind to his question. He expected a mountain-sized answer. And I repeat my answer as though it ought to answer his question. The danger of my answers is plain enough. He might come to believe that they're adequate. My answers bully his questions into silence. If my answers win, I've helped him to dress his wonder with a Nixon mask. My children are much more reasonable than I am. My daughter holds the giant sucker she put, purchased. Look what I buy, she brags to her brother. Look what you bought, dear, I said to correct her. But dad, she said, I knowed how to say it. And she's right. Technically, she applies the rule of speech too consistently, more consistently than I do. My big job now is to short circuit her reason with the many, many exceptions of language. Oddly enough, I've learned to think of these exceptions to, the langu to language's logic as reasonable. My children's questions help me map up my vast and sprawling ignorance. Late in June, my daughter May watches the horizon slide an oatmeal raisin moon into the sky. What is the moon, she asks. I'm tempted to tell her it's a natural satellite of the Earth, orbiting it monthly, illuminated by the sun and reflecting some of that light back to Earth. She would take a moment to measure my answer against what she'd seen with her eyes. And then she would look at me as though I told her a joke that she doesn't understand. Instead, I shut my mouth and let her moon hang there. Yes, my children are more reasonable than I. 
Listen to this question my daughter Elise asked. Why aren't the planets noses? She had to ask it several times until I understood the question's size. I couldn't find an answer big enough. Why aren't the planets noses? Why aren't horses as small as dogs and dogs as big as whales? And why don't birds fly in the water and fish swim in the air? Thank you so much for including me in this book. It's, mm -hmm. lo it's lovely to be included. It's lovely. You're, you're very welcome. It's, it's a little bit like I said. It's, uh, half, half of it is for me and half of it is for you. I, get, I got the better end of the deal. I get, I get, I get the, uh, the ease of uh, authorization and contact. <laughs> and, uh, and then you get some bit of free publicity. So it's all good. Uh, well, I, I'm afraid, or I'm happy that this uh, will bring bring the, our reading to a close. And um, and uh, and again, uh, translate. Uh, this is a wonderful um, venture, a wonderful initiative. Uh, paper these days, people are asking, uh, why don't you just put the stuff online, and why do you bother with the with printing and the cost of printing. Um, I, for one, and, and Bill and Tanya, and if you're here, maybe you as well, still value the, uh, well, value the value of books and, uh, and, uh, and hopefully you'll, uh, you'll help support a little bit of, uh, of this. So as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, there's a, um, a kaleidoscope of uh, nine languages, Chinese, Danish, English, French, Italian, Polish, Romanian, Russian, and Spanish. Uh, Canadian indigenous voices mixed with immigrant stories, old world and new world narratives come together. Numbers, mathematics even, infuse life realities with poetry and coexist with children perspectives fantasy tales and myths. Engaging characters, even Santa Claus and, and the Tooth Fairy play a part and uh, give life to the poems and short stories included in Translate 12. So thank you so much for coming and uh, have a good evening.